Shalom and welcome to this teaching from Messianic Delaware. My name is Jerry Mitchell and it is such an honor and a pleasure to have you join us today as we bring this discussion with you, or to you I should say, concerning Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 is probably one of the most familiar psalms uh, that we have in all of the Bible. In all of the book of Psalms and everything else, if I had to pick two things that stand out, it would be John 3.16 uh, and Psalm 23. Those are probably the two uh, most familiar to Christians worldwide, for sure, and to most people worldwide, at least in the people that I've had an opportunity to speak with. When I was getting ready to write my second book, God's Universe, God's Rules, I actually took... Uh, some time to do some research and every time I had the opportunity in conversation to to bring up Psalm 23 and you know kind of I didn't really question people about it and what they do I would you know kind of integrate it into the conversation and ask you know what what they thought of it what was you know what was most familiar and either the beginning the Lord is my shepherd that's what most Christians uh, remember about Psalm 23 People who are either, I mean, let's not, really, really can't call them Christian, but we really can't call them atheists. They're probably agnostic would be the best description for these folks. They are familiar with Psalm 23 because of one line. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. They hear it, you know, if they happen to attend a Christian funeral, typically you're going to hear this psalm uh, because of that verse. We're going to look at that just a little bit. But they are familiar with this psalm. Most people, and, and I, I say this, most people know about this psalm. A and sometimes that's not always a good thing because we integrate what we hear through either entertainment, you know, television and movies and songs, and we try to, to put that and some meaning of what we get from our entertainment industry uh, and apply that to what this psalm means. But let's look at it today in a little bit different way. W I want to look at what was David's thought process as he wrote this. What was he thinking as he was be being given these words, as he was being given these visions, as he, was, as he sat and pondered how to write this. And how to express what he was being given. What was he thinking? Did he understand how prophetic this was? As it's being written. And as it's being uh, laid out for him. What did he. You know, what, what was he thinking? When he finished this. Did he look back at it and go. Oh wow that's really good. You know people are going to. People are going to be memorizing this they're going to be teaching this in Sunday school in 2000 or 3000 years I doubt that was his thought process I really do I think for David this was more of a a way to express praise and worship but let's kind of examine some things and I want to begin uh, you know by saying that the Bible itself especially the what we consider the Old Testament, okay? It, everything that was we know was originally written in Hebrew is written in four literary forms. Now, don't mistake this, what I just said. Uh, you know, the rabbis will tell you that the Bible is written on four levels, and they, they express these levels in different ways, and by the time you get to the fourth level, oh, you are just on such this high plane. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to talk about the literary forms, the literary forms. And these four begin with the literal. It's something that really happened. You know, Jesus wept. You, you know when it says that Yeshua wept, we can just picture tears running down his face. He was, he was sad. He was very emotional at this point. There are some other things that are very literal in the Bible. You know, it's, it's pick one out. You know, Noah at some point had to leave the ark, right? So it says when he left the ark, that's literal. It really happened. Just like 
in the beginning when God spoke and created. We can take that as literal. That's all he needed to do. He needed to express something and as he uh, breathed out uh, that that first those first words and you know something with the weight of that breath of our creator it went out and it began to form and it began to build and it began to bring his thought processes together so literal is you know if it really actually happened it was physical it was absolute you know you could either see it or hear it or taste it or touch it or feel it you had to you know it's it's real it actually happened that's the literal meanings of it but then we get into something interesting it's also written in a metaphorical level and that is applying action to something that can't be real you know being raised up on eagle's wings is a metaphor we don't you're not literally raised up on eagle's wings but that is the image that is the picture that is being presented you know, in Matthew 23 we see a hen that gathers her chicks now obviously our creator is not a hen that gathers chicks but this is the metaphor this is the uh, applied action to something uh, in Psalm 91 4 you know, to cover you with his feathers you know does does God does our creator have feathers well he might if he needs them I'm sure he could but it's a metaphor it means to to hold you in that place of safety and if you're being held in that place of safety then you know, that is the image that they want to use. That's what the metaphorical level is. Now, there's also what we consider to be an implied level or an implied form. And that suggests something without saying it. You know, Noah gets off the ark. You know, he plants a vineyard. He makes some wine. He gets drunk. All that happens. And all of that happens in just two, one or two verses. But it implies a passage of time. How long does it take to plant a vineyard? How long does it take to grow grapes? How long does it take to process and make wine? How long does it take to do these things as Noah did them? It takes time. And in just one or two verses, we have the span of probably three or four years of time. That's what is implied there is, is there's a passage of time. It didn't happen overnight as we think of overnight it happens it takes time so as these things take time it's that's what's implied now there's one more that's really interesting and that is the hidden form and that means that there's something there that we need to search for there's something in the wording we and, and it's almost like that wink of an eye it's almost like somebody who is talking to you they're not saying look over there but they're pointing over there you know and sometimes we read in scripture let him he who has ears let him hear and that you know that that's what we call a clue okay that is not just an eye wink that's not just finger pointing but that's you know, kind of turning you around and say look over that direction right there you got to listen to what's going on over there and sometimes, sometimes, this is interesting, you get all four in the same passage. But you don't always have to have all four in the same passage. You know, some things are just literal, some things are just metaphorical, some things are just implied, and some things we really have to study and study and study to figure out because they are hidden very well. There's other things... Um, you know, that we need to look at as well. If we look at Isaiah 66, 22, you know, it says, for as the new heavens and new earth, which I will make. Well, that's in Isaiah 66. What does it say in Revelation? I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, be coming uh, down from heaven because the first earth 
or the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. That's not a new concept. It's back in Isaiah. Isaiah said there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Most people overlook that. And they think it's hidden, but it's actually not hidden. It is right out there in plain sight. We just overlook it. Zechariah 14, the feast will continue into the millennial kingdom. You know, it says so right there. And we can look at that and say, oh, you know what? There's going to be some things that, that keep going. These things really aren't, they're not, not everything is hiding in a hidden place. Some of it is right out there where we can see it. We just don't realize it when we are simply reading the Bible. Okay, so as we go through this and we think about the way it's written, we can look at these things and say, okay, is this something literal? Is this metaphorical? Am I looking at something? Am I supposed to gather something from this that's not being said? And a lot of times when we look at prophetic writings, it doesn't come right out and say, well, you know, there's going to be this fellow who was born and he's going to be crucified on a, on a cross or he's going to be nailed to a tree however you want to say it the bible doesn't say that it implies it it infer you know, we can infer what is implied right but it doesn't come right out and say this is what's going to happen it is there's places you have to, to pull things together from to get those prophetic things so with that being said, what do we think of Psalm 23? Let's, let's look at it from our viewpoint for just a second. Is it a psalm of comfort because it's recited at funerals? Well, it can be. It can be a very good psalm of comfort. I, there's better ones. There's, there really are better psalms of comfort than Psalm 23. But this is the most familiar, probably because it's a lot shorter and a lot easier for people to, to grasp. Uh, you know, we, we like that instant gratification kind of a thing. You, you know, I don't want to think about this, so we just have that instant gratification. Is it a psalm of submission where God leads us? Oh, you've got to be willing to follow. Oh, you've got to, well, yeah, kind of. It kind of is. But you know what <laughs> Psalm 23 really is? Psalm 23 is a victory march. But along with this victory march, whose victory march is it? This is a psalm of prophecy. Absolutely, it is prophecy. And we will see that uh, how that works its way into this because we're going to look at this and we're going to see how not only David uh, was looking at this as, as he was putting it together, but we're also going to look at it through someone else's eyes. And that is the eyes of Yeshua. And we're going to start with verse 1. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. David knew what a shepherd was. He knew his job as a shepherd when he was a young man was to care for the animals they're responsible for. We don't lack anything that our Creator wants us to have. Now, when we look at this from the standpoint of Yeshua, obviously this is a metaphor because, you know, our, you know God is God, and, and we can say that He shepherds us, but for that to be true, then we need to be sheep. And quite honestly, sheep are not the most intelligent animals on the face of the earth. They need to be led. They need you know, that, uh, that shepherd to guide them. But they, one thing they are smart enough to know most of the time is that they need somebody to, to guide them through their lives. They need somebody to show them where the good food is because sheep quite honestly, we'll trample down about 10 acres of good pasture to go eat weeds that aren't good for them. Uh, I don't know why that is, but that seems to be what they will do. And they need that shepherd to kind of keep them uh, in that place where the good stuff is. 
But as David's writing this, he knows the job of a shepherd. He knows what's going on. But think of it from this viewpoint of prophecy. Who was the perfect lamb? If Yeshua is the perfect lamb of God, as John says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? Now we have not just the perfect shepherd in this metaphor, but we have the perfect sheep in this metaphor as well. Have you ever thought about Psalm 23 quite like that? I kind of doubt most people do because we like to skip over these things. We don't like to spend too much time dwelling on the prophetic. We don't like to spend too much time dwelling on someone else's viewpoint. We like instant gratification. We like to think of things the way we like to think of things sometimes, don't we? But hopefully as, as I start going through there and, and you begin to hear these things and consider them, you're going to look at Psalm 23 just a little differently. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Does he literally force you to lay down in the grass? No, he doesn't. Again, this is a metaphor. He causes us, you know, and, and we have this really beautiful illustration. You know, he causes us to, to, to lie down in these green pastures where we're comfortable. The still waters where everything is fine. We're guided as a shepherd guides sheep. Sometimes we don't want to go there. We have to be willing to submit to the Father's will. Again, let's, you know, from David's point of view, being a shepherd, taking care of sheep, this is what he wanted for his flock. Right. He wants them in nice grass. He wants them you know, to drink from the still calm waters, the crystal clear, beautiful running water. And we could go a long way with that one as well. But. I'm going to take you down a different path right now in Luke 22. Yeshua in the garden. Father, if you're willing to take this cup from me. Not for my will but I will do whatever you want to be done. Do you think on that night and that next day, do you think that was calm, cool, tall, green grass? Do you think that was still water? I don't think it was. I don't think that Yeshua was being uh, made to lie down in green pastures. I don't think he was drinking from still water, I think it was a very turbulent, very ugly 20-some hours of time. And as we think of it that way, this metaphor begins to melt just a little bit, doesn't it? When we think of it, you know, here is what God wants for us. Sometimes we have to go through some other things to get where we're going. Here's where that metaphor begins to fade away. He restores my soul and he guides me in the straight paths for his name's sake. Very familiar passage in this psalm. But for his name's sake, because of his name, he makes us whole, not because of us, but to establish his name because of who he is okay it's it's he doesn't do it for us you know he doesn't need us we need him and we see this and and again looking at this very prophetically do you think david realized when he was when he was actually putting these words down that there would be one soul in particular that, that would be restored. There would be one straight path that, get, that is our example to follow. I, I sometimes wonder when I think of these things, did Yeshua actually understand how the Father was going to restore His soul? How 
you know, as Yeshua was doing these things that the Father wanted him to do, was, you know, did he realize he was being guided in the straight path? And now up to this point, you know, Yeshua is using, or I'm sorry, David's using some, a lot of metaphors. And they begin to melt away. He begins to change gears. And as he changes gears, you know, we read, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The most familiar verse in the psalm. Now, here we have a picture of night, death, and the devil. And it's by German, German artist Albrecht Dior. And this is the image that we often see in our minds in some form or another or some fashion or another. But think about this. Let's look at it from a different point. If our Creator, God, is light, and we are going to walk in a shadow of death. Who then casts that shadow of death? Well, of course. <laughs> you know, none other than, than Satan himself, right? If he is dark and he comes between man and light, we are now in this shadow, not in the bright light of life, but we are in this shadow of death. But even as we are in the shadow of death, who is there with us? Now, as David's writing this, is he still, is he thinking that one of his descendants, a thousand years later, or some years later, I, my, my timing sometimes get, gets a little confused, and it's easier to speak in time, terms of even numbers. But years later, would one of his descendants actually descend into that place of death is that what's going on in david's mind or does he not quite understand what this particular passage is going to mean as yeshua descends into death it's kind of interesting he says i'm not going to fear any evil that's there because our creator God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And when he says, you are even here with me. That that tells me that comforts me. And it says, you know, even though <laughs> even though Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Noah and all of these, even though they are resting in their grave. Who's with them because they simply are sleeping? Yeshua is, you know, probably looking at or knowing this verse saying, I don't have to be afraid of this because the Father is the God of the living. Simply because we move from this particular physical world into something else. He doesn't mean that he's not there. He's still there. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to fear evil. You're with me even in death. Even in that sleep that takes us to our next resurrection. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You know, rod in, in this particular context is discipline and it's also support those things you know your your discipline what you have given me the way that i have been trained to think the way that i have been trained to act the way, all of these things they come together to support me and it's interesting that bread is the staff of life psalm 105 beginning in verse 14. He suffered no man to do them wrong. He reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. And in verse 16, Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. You know, that, that word staff there 
is <laughs> it's not just a stick okay it is the staff of life it is that staff of bread he is referring right there to Yeshua and if you look at the blessing that comes with the bread what does it say who brings forth the bread from the earth you know, we, I, we really don't grasp the concept a lot of times of how all of these things are connected in Scripture. They are all so much connected. It, it is amazing that, that this continuation of these themes we see over and over and over again. Even, even in these things that, and now this is implied, okay? This is what is implied. So even in these things, and we look and we say, well, is there something hidden? And we keep digging and digging and digging. And yeah, there is. Because when you go back and you start putting things together, it's like, oh, wow. Here we're talking about staff, bread, life. And it comes down to Yeshua, doesn't it? Now, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This really isn't a good example. This picture is not a good example of Middle Eastern table matters at the time. So what, what was David presenting to us? What was, you know, David's, you know, preparing a table. David was a king. He knew. He knew certain things, okay? Okay. Here I have a picture of a burnt house and showing how low these tables are. These were for eating. See, sitting upright in the presence of your enemies, that was for negotiation. David understood this part. He was a king. He knew how to negotiate, right? He knew. He knew politics, plain and simple. David knew how to negotiate. So when we think about negotiating with our enemies, what comes to our mind? What, what comes to my mind, and this is the best picture I could find of it, is a table prepared for your enemy's unconditional surrender. If, I, if, if the Almighty, if you are on God's side, your will defeat your enemies. It's that simple. Because God's going to win. And when you defeat your enemies. And you're on God's side. It will be absolute unconditional surrender from evil. That's that's plain and simple. That's given. That's that's what it says. Basically, that's what it says. So here we see. One side absolutely standing tall, victorious. The other side signing the document of unconditional surrender and defeat. Ultimately, ultimately, the way that document will be dealt with is in a lake of fire. That will be the ultimate unconditional surrender of the enemies of the creator of the universe this absolutely is a victory march this absolutely is prophetic this absolutely <laughs> absolutely uh, displays much of the life of Yeshua You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. You know, we, you have to submit to being anoint, anointed. It's very, very difficult to pour oil on someone's head who's running away. Isn't it? If we submit, if we follow our Creator's instructions, we are promised that we will receive many, many blessings. You know, this isn't about sheep anymore. Okay, that metaphor melted away a few verses ago. 
In John 12, we see Mary Magdalene who pours ointment of nard, which is a very, very expensive anointing oil. It's a perfume made from a Himalayan plant. And, you know, there was some, some contention there. Why'd you do that? You know what we could have done with the money? But who was submissive? Who allowed this to happen? You know, often we overlook what's going on because we want it to be something else. We want it to be something it isn't. This is absolutely, absolutely about Yeshua. Now, the cup in this verse, you know, a cup uh, basically comes from the root word in Hebrew. It, it means to hold something together. It's a container of sort. And it says, you know, I've got so much. I can't hold it all together. I've got so much good stuff. I've got so many blessings. They're not all going to fit. I can't count them all. It's just impossible for me to hold it all together. All the good stuff that's coming in, I just can't. You can't grasp the concept of how good good can be when you are willing to be obedient, when you are willing to follow your Creator's instructions, when you're willing to live the life you are designed to live. Remember, David's not writing about sheep anymore. Here, we see a very familiar concept where you're pouring oil over this sheep's head but the shepherd himself has to hold this sheep in order for this to be done now it's done for the sheep's good there's no question about that it keeps uh flies and and other insects out of their face so they're they can feed more comfortable and when you're uh when livestock is, is feeding in a comfortable manner they're gaining weight they're being healthy you know, I worked with large animals for a long time. Calves, if you're raising beef calves, you want them to gain at least a pound a day. Two pounds is better, which means they've got to eat a lot of grass, which means they've got to be content to stand and eat. If, if you're not, <laughs> if, if those animals are not in a position where they can gain weight as they're growing, where they can stay healthy with the feed they're on, you need to get them in a different pasture. That's the whole concept of pouring oil on uh, a sheep's head years ago. Is that's what they used for insect control. That's what they used to keep the burrs and the brambles. Made it a lot easier to get them out of the, the, the wool. But the sheep really didn't like it. They weren't comfortable with it. And so what they would do is they would kind of fight and twist and turn. They were not submissive. They were not submissive. When you are willing to be submissive and you are willing to have that, <laughs> let, let's, I'm going to use this word, slimy stuff being poured all over you, that takes some self-discipline, okay? Because it, it tickles. It really does. If you've ever changed oil in a car and had that hot oil run up your arm as you take the, the drain plug out, it tickles. It's not a comfortable feeling. No wonder the sheep want to twist and turn away from it just a little bit. Here we go. This one is interesting. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, forever is a very long time, isn't it? When we receive the blessings that our creator wants to give us good things god's mercy will be with us you know i don't know if david had this same vision that john had you know john gives us you know he was told to measure this thing out if this was the vision that david had when he was being given this this is what the house of the lord's going to look like and i'm going to be there is it any wonder that he could say about his son who died you know he can't come back to where I am, but I can go to where he is. David absolutely was a prophet. He knew. He was given these, these things to, to write. He was shown these things. I'm not sure how much 
he knew. I'm not sure if he understood everything that he knew. But I think we can look from the way he writes and we can look at the things David puts down. We get a, a, a little snapshot. We get a, a single frame out of an entire movie of David's life. And we can say, David was a prophet. He might not have known it. He might not have understood it. But, he, but we know that he was a prophet. When Yeshua, you know, was going through the things he was going through, did he think about this verse? Did, <laughs> did goodness and mercy follow him? Well, he had mercy. He was good, but good wasn't done to him. He, he had to endure a lot of things to get where he was going. He had to endure a lot of things to get to hear and you know what even before he endured just before he endured all that he told somebody he told his disciples he said look in my father's house we're there's going to be a lot of places it's going to be huge it's going to be great it's going to be fantastic there's many mansions. If it were not true, I would not have told you. You know, Yeshua may have understood. He may have seen this. He may have been building it already. It may, have, it may be already done. I'm not sure. But here, David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If we remain faithful, if we live the life we're given to live, the, in the way we are designed to live it. We will be there too. We have that opportunity to be there. That opportunity to live in that new Jerusalem. That opportunity to be in the presence of our creator forever. Did David know what it was going to look like? I don't know. John was the one that was told to measure it out and tell us how big it was told to write it down and say, look, you make sure people know this. Maybe it's possible that the reason John was told to, to, to do all those things was because people had lost track already of what David was talking about in the Psalms. You'd be amazed how much of Revelation actually can go back to the Psalms and go, oh, you know what? That comes right out of, right out of the Psalms. It's, you know, for me, the Psalms are just another book of prophecy. Is Psalm 23 a psalm of comfort? It can be. Is it a psalm of worship? Absolutely. But it is a psalm of victory and it is a psalm of prophecy. Psalm 23 is many, many things. And it has in it each and every one of the four literary forms of which the Bible is written. It has the literal. It has the metaphorical. It has implied some things, and there are some things in there that we need to seek out so that we understand them better. Psalm 23, one of the most familiar psalms, not only among our Jewish friends, but among Christians. But it's also unfortunately one of the most misunderstood because we want to limit psalm 23 to what we want it to mean instead of being open and seeing it for what our creator designed it to be with that i am going to end i've gone a little longer than i usually like to go but we thank you once again for uh joining us for this examination of Psalm 23. I hope it has been a blessing to you. I hope it has been uh, eye-opening to you. I wish you many, many, many blessings. Amen.